just want to introduce uh, Mark Ubisky. He's going to bring up uh, our uh, amazing panel here that has given us joy uh, for many years. I'm really proud of this exhibit, um, not only because uh, you know I've gotten old enough that I can see my youth represented in a history museum, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but also because you know I in the way that memory works, you know, for me over over time, it you know it, it can begin. It can be. I look back and I think of a, a lot of the struggle and a lot of the dark times, a lot of the loss um, in the 80s and 90s in particular in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I am still in my grieving process, I guess I should say, with that. Uh, but then I forget uh, the, the parties that we had and the joy that we had in our, our, our act up meetings and the laughter and the sex and the music and you know the partying and the clubs and much of that because I didn't really experience it until I was well into my 40s. But anyway, um, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of us were having fun. And I think it's important to remember to tell that story. So I'll turn it over to Mark Bishke, who is the publisher of 48 Hills. Um, he's a long time historian. <laughs> Muff died, 
so many guys um, that when I started Colossus, I didn't quite realize that essentially every bathhouse, most of the bars, every nightclub had closed because um, you know it was it was uh, everyone was just decimated. So when I opened that, it was basically. Um, an explosion of people like, okay, we've suffered enough, we've paid enough, so many people have died, um, we need to get back out there, we need to get on the dance floor, we need to enjoy life as we can. So I just, that, that has always been so important to me and I kind of didn't even realize that I was basically at the forefront of a re-emerging gay party scene. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a tremendous honor and only other thing I can say is it's it's a lot harder now to do parties. The venues are almost nil. Um, everything that used to be an, an open air warehouse and you could blast music all night now has techie condos right next door. Um, and it's the landscape has changed. It's still wonderful, but um, I would say late eighties, early nineties, everything was so new and fresh and obviously very important. So thank you. All right, I remember going to Yes Clubs when I was 17 or 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't even think I lived here yet when we got these invitations to these clubs, and uh, it was fabulous. It's like it was fun music, fun people. And, uh, and moving to the city, uh, living with a bunch of cool people, uh, Greg Taylor and Javier thought, oh, mm -hmm. this would be a great idea. Crystal Pistol. And yeah. they did, they designed the flyer, and they're like, Michael and Lewis, do you want to do this? And I'm like, okay, sure, we got a bunch of records. And, uh, <laughs> and we did it, and it was, it was quite a success. And it was only 99 cents, so, you know, we could beat that. And uh, from there, we uh, thought, okay, we can open another club. We call it Club Screw on Friday night. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. A lot of people just threw themselves into it. Dancers, performers, everything. And uh, um, after that, uh, I, I was doing a lot of uh, just DJing with uh, Nikki Rivera. We thought, okay, let's open another club. Let's try to bring some things together. Uh, let's be To a club called Fusion, and we did that on Thursday night at the Oasis, and it went pretty well. It was fun, and uh, anyway, I'm happy to be here to see you all. And Yeah, you've done a comment on me. 
I, 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 I don't remember his name. So yeah. I just remember he was pretty fabulous, and I just love that show. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like the mullet. Cody, yeah, we had some doctors. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, oh, oh my so god. Yeah, 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 Dave yeah. Moore, John Baird, oh, Tyler, um, Alex Chee. Alex Chee, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, 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 and oh my god. Uh, Jamie and Michael. Beer, beer can Mike. <laughs> Tyler. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we jumped ahead. This is Tyler and Goli. Yeah. Is he here? Tyler, are you here? Tylerella, 2000. No. No. <laughs> Off Yeah, Tyler. Yeah, yeah, so there was a connection <laughs> to Club Situ. Yeah. And we saw the first one. Um, so Steve the Lady. The Steve Lady. 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 Lady.
gathering of everybody. And what, it, it was in 87, it was April of 87 when we opened. <clears throat> and of course, all of us were all experiencing, <coughs> at that time, just the decimation of all of the boys in our community. And, you know, I think, that, you know, people ask me, what was it about the box that made it so right? And I think it was certainly a lot of things, but I think a huge component of it was that uh, this was a place where you could go and one of the things that I, I think that even at the time in my recollection at that time was that people didn't even totally know how you got AIDS. Mm -hmm. So there was this whole kind of tension that, you know, the guys were not touching each other. People were not actually physically touching each other in the club, my recollection in the early days. And what we found out, and we actually even had a t-shirt that said dancing is safe sex. And you know, there was like so much tension, uh, sexual tension, with all of us. We were young and we were, you know, and, and so the dance floor just became this like, expl I'm getting chills. Uh, because it was so explosive and it was so um, just transformative. It was a place that you could just go. I think, you know, the men's community was, was, um, uh, was learning and, we, and the women were learning that we were taking care of a lot of the boys. So the women's community and the men's community were making a, a, a connection, a really deep connection in, the, in that way. And there was just this thing, you know, I mean, after you go to like four memorial services that week, you know, you, you just were like, oh my God, so you get uh, together, you turn the music up. I mean, I had the best sound in the room, Randy Schiller. <laughs> and I, I was a freak for really good sound. And uh, you, you wanted good sound, you got Randy. And um, we, we just went on a trip together, you know. <coughs> that's where we became a magic card. To get away from the really good, really good. It was magic. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. What Paige was saying is, make no mistake, is aside from in the in the first wave, second wave of AIDS, when it was just so hardcore. Aside from men taking care of each other. It was the women that were just right there and um, so supportive and so loving. And um, so that's, that was incredible. Um, to me, um, it's this combination, like I mentioned in the introduction, of um, men reemerging and coming back out to the clubs. Um, and I almost, I think I remember a BAR article about when I started Colossus. It was a little hardcore. The, the, headline was, um, I think it was dancing in the face of death. And so that's pretty, it sounds hardcore, but um, to me it was a combination of lots and lots of fundraisers, constant fundraisers, both big time and I remember we had essentially a, a jar for donations for um, the AIDS Foundation that just sat on the bar of the club for for several years every week. So it was basically everybody was rallying, doing everything that they could. The other thing was, you know, I was looking for some of my old photos and you almost couldn't go two or three photos without seeing an old friend that had died. And so at the height of it, um, I was probably losing a friend or a go-go boy or a DJ or somebody, you know, just about two or three a month for a while there. So that was just, it was just, um, it was awful. But uh, the other thing, uh, I had Underwork, I, I still periodically do it, but Underworld, the Underwork party, you know, a thousand boys in briefs, what have you, and the AIDS Foundation would come by and drop off giant boxes of condoms. So that's one thing, is we had condoms all over the place. And, um, you know, it got frisky in the corners and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Thank God we had those, and I, I would like to think that that made somewhat of a difference. But again, it's you know it was uh, devastating and somber, and at the same time, as Paige said, there's this kind of crackling underbelly of energy, of sexual energy, um, in the face of something so tragic. So, and Lewis, I feel like you the Uranus is more of a punk rock attitude. Definitely, um, but the fact is that on Thursday, half the Houston nights says ACT UP issues, and so everybody from ACT UP would come to chaos on Thursday nights. You know, I wasn't in ACT UP, but all these people came from ACT UP after uh, every week, and 
themselves act up queer nation? Uh, yeah, I know that. So I want to talk a little bit because I was raised about women being at the root of the scene, and I have a there was a question from Wade Palmer, uh, one of the seamsters, who, who can't be here. Here, no, he's at Cat Club. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so oh, we're okay. in Cat Club. Go say hi to him after. And he wanted to talk a little bit about the Doug team from back then. And we uh, in the audience we have DJ Stephanie from Female Trouble. Yeah. Um, seen in a really long time um, and I think that we had um, you know a, a different sense of community that that I don't think you see now you know we, we um, I think this is really um, important that this is happening again um, and I you know speaking back to, to female trouble and, and um, I think we started in 87 um, you know, it was it was a different time. It was it was AIDS, and it and it was um, it, it was really scary. Um, even though I don't think that it was really affecting us, it was affecting us because it was affecting our brothers. 
Um, and, you know, I, I, it, it was really hard. I mean, I heard, I heard you say, Gus, you know, like how you were losing three people, at, you know, at, 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 um, during the course of a month. I remember being at the detour when I was working there, and I would literally be out the night before with people and go in and they wouldn't show up for work. And I'm like, you know, where, where's, you know, Mark or whatever. And we would go check their house and find out that they had passed. And but yet they were, we were out at the hole in the wall the night before, you know? Um, it, it was really, it was really hard. And, and um, so I'm not talking about the dyke scene. I'm actually just talking about that <laughs> moment. I know. Um, it, you know, the, the, the dyke scene just kind of, you know, it was it was really punk rock. And loud, very, and very loud. loud. I mean, I I kind of took a I, I went against the grain at that moment and started to play uh, rock when nobody else was, and um, kind of started an underground. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was it was definitely an underground movement. I mean, no, you know, I, I remember playing Patti Smith and and. Um, Diamanda Galas, as Michael will tell you, I remember playing Diamanda Galas at the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we were just punk, and and and, but yet, I mean, it, in, in that same vein, I, I was backing it up with you know, OPP, and 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 it all and Salt and Pepper. I remember playing with Paige, uh, closing night of the Baybrook. And salt and pepper at that night, you know, was at its uh, best, and I think it was probably about two and a half minutes long on, on the 12 inch, and it, we just kept it going. We had two records, and just kept it going. Um, yeah, it it was just a different time. I mean, and and anybody that was there can can attest to that, you know. So I'm not, I'm rambling. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
big, big sort of mega party, you know, following in the footsteps of the old mega parties that Randy was a huge part of here in San Francisco, the, the legacy of the mega parties. We started doing the girls' mega parties and Club Q opened up and um, was just, you know, it was just insane. No idea. I mean, when I opened both the box and Club Q, I had no idea they were going to be, A, successful, and I just wanted to play music. You not the best dancer. Have the club. Can we give it up for the box dance? <laughs> And that's what 
you know, a lot of the foods I just wanted to hear. And the gay men, too. Um, there's a lot of the alternative gay men.
something like this here. Oh, yeah, I know. I hear it tomorrow. Yeah. I would love to do it. Oh, my God. Um, guys, talk a little bit about your music and your singing. And, and well, first off, um, we used to call the box the sweat box. So it was no joke. I mean, it was pistol hot in there. And um, it was phenomenal. It was a real inspiration to me. Um, and one thing I keep thinking about is, as far as I know these days, you don't see maybe El Rio or something, but you don't see lines down the block all night long. And there was a couple hundred people that couldn't even get in. I mean, they were like standing out there all night. So for me, um, uh, growing up in the city, first I was like Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Stoner. <laughs> then I went um, pretty hardcore into the punk scene. So Wade and I always bond over that. So punk and hardcore and new wave. Uh, and I started throwing underground warehouse parties. That was probably um, 85 to 87. And that was all new wave. So we're talking like New Order and, and um, Depeche Mode and stuff. And then old school hip hop. So it was like LL Cool J. And then literally in a very short period of time, um, 88, thanks to Steve Favis, hello, uh, is literally almost overnight, I mean, I had the same crowd that used to come and dance to old school hip hop and new wave, and then overnight, it was house music. And it was original house music, so very jazzy, real percussion. And I just remember some of my crowd saying, well, that was, First time I went, it was, it was a little weird, hard to dance to, but I'm getting into it. And then, of course, like the pure uh, ecstasy helped, the pure MDM. <laughs> <laughs> I, I completely remember this one point saying that. She said, first I couldn't dance to it, and then, you know, I popped something, and oh my god. So, uh, if anything, it was, <laughs> if anything, it was just, it was so goddamn brand new. House music was just pretty much overnight, uh, really just exploded um, in San Francisco. Um, another cool thing is like Colossus, which was end of 89 till almost 93, is um, since we were one of the first to play house and it was big scale club, so this was like literally like 1,500 people every week. Um, I had Hoshkarelli early. Um, and then Jerry Bonham, who a lot of you know, would play late. And so Jerry was a little more on the techno edge. So the coolest thing was we would get for after hours um, sometimes two or three hundred straight British kids that would come <laughs> because they, uh, they already had techno and rave and house in the UK. So we're talking like Gano and Garth and Josh and all them. So they would come down. Um, and it just really was magnificent to watch the mixture of the crowd. So I think that's important to realize too, is that it was just, um, you don't quite see that much of a mishmash of people anymore, uh, really at any point. So it was gay, straight, drag queens, um, very colorful, very diverse. But yeah, so that was amazing to me is that these straight kids would come and dance like crazy late night. So um, yeah. And I, I mean, I have to say, the music was so much better back then. Don't tell me what said. No more parties. No comment. But yeah, it was, it was uh, oh, and then the last thing was, is I, of course, like I kind of said before, I wasn't tremendously aware of the whole 70s gay scene. And when I was into Led Zeppelin, we hated disco, of course. Yeah. But <laughs> what I realized, connecting the dots, is that the roots of house lie in disco. Old school Chicago, New York, and um, that made sense to me after a while. So, and you guys were—I mean, like I think also staking your claim <coughs> that different sound was providing a platform for actually national touring acts. Like I remember, they showed that we got a, we've got a poster back there where Queen Latifah played a New Year's Eve party at the box, and uh, we have a picture. Of Melissa, have a picture of. Jones appearance. Her yeah. only live appearance in 1989, I believe, at Atlas. It was Atlas. Atlas. So, so the that was actually ni the end of 90. Yeah. So I started Colossus end of 89, and then you know got all cocky. So hey, I'm going to do a Friday night too. So we went over to City Nights, and within the first couple months, I actually uh, booked Grace Jones, and she hadn't been here in a while, and that was just end all. 
So I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> and but no, she, I mean, how good does she still look? Oh, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, like, I think a year or two ago, she sold out the Hollywood Bowl and everything. So I got her for like 15 grand or something. And some, some uh, folklore from that is one, her 10 year old son was by himself in her hotel room at the Fairmont like, all night long. And uh, we didn't have cell phones those days, no texting or whatever. So I had to send guys out on cocaine runs twice. <laughs> so it was literally two eight balls of coke. And then she got up and she did it. Am I supposed to say it? No, so amazing performance, uh, two and a half hours long, and she ended up getting very uh, emotional about all the men uh, that she had lost. And so, you know, predating my whole thing is she was at the Trocadero and probably I beam and stuff like that. And so that, you know, she watched her whole audience essentially get wiped out. Um, last part of that is she made it all the way through the night and then end up seven o'clock in the morning, she fell in the fountain with a $3,000 gown. So that'll go on my book someday. But, uh, and, yeah, all true. Uh, and then, as you said, I mean, I had over the years, um, Yomanda, Black Box, 49ers, uh, Inner City, who was incredible, Mika Paris, I think. Um, and those was strange, is before that, when I was, <laughs> uh, my party crew at the Trocadero, um, I ended up having uh, Tone Loaf. So I had like this hardcore rapper. <laughs> and I, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, stuff like that. So it was a little bit more flexible. And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to just put a little story with a Queen Latifah story. Um, uh, Jimmy Lyons from the Nightbreak had called me. He was a, a, a event producer, and it was right when the box was starting. And I'm going to go, God, I've got to get this wrapper. I'm going to get, I'm going to bring her in. It's 500 bucks, you know, and she's uh -huh. new, and I mean, she is on fire. What? Who the hell is Queen Latifah? I've never heard of <laughs> I said no. <laughs> what? I said I was going to like, whatever. Anyway, a year later, she was worth thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. I couldn't get enough. And anyway, about a, about a year ago, I got a phone call from a friend, and she said, "I can't believe that you had two copies of the box." I mean, I can't believe. It. And I was like, "No." And she said, "No, you did. He was there." And I said, I would know if you bought the box, believe me. It's giving me, you know, chills to even say it. And she said, no, I'm telling you, she was, he was there with Queen Latifah that night. I would know. Anyway, I looked at the video, I dug it up, and he was there. Yeah. And it was before he was even famous. And he was like her best friend and hung out with a cute little overalls. And he did stuff on the I didn't even know. I didn't even know. She was and, and in her um, in her contract, one of the things in her contract said that she wanted two male servants. Two male servants. I was like, I was like, well, I was like, she, you know, she, was, she wanted the boys to work, I mean, you know, get on their knees and, you know, do whatever. Anyway, I was like, okay, wait, so seriously, I'm supposed to do this? Like, I didn't really know if it was a joke or not. <laughs> Also, like, 
speed metal from that. And then there's like also, you know, I mean, it's kind of like you play it, and then there's like sea punk. <laughs> like it kind of like goes all over. So tell us a little bit about the musical aesthetic of your age. Okay, first uh, I would say I used to go to the Bosch and dance there, and at the end of the night, that the floor was just soaking wet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but deodorant free. Somebody had a 
baby on stage. I remember someone had an abortion, but I don't remember the person. <laughs> <laughs> from the girl. Hi, my name is Ivy. I actually work at the stud. I do the door every Friday, but thanks for this incredible history tour. It's, it's amazing to know our lineage. And I love the way that you're pulling in like, art and nightlife and activism and community. And I just heard you say Jerome's name, and you're mentioning Jerome Kaha, yeah. Rest in Power. But I would love to hear more about artists and their and their collaboration in the clubs, including maybe a story about Jerome. <laughs> uh, so maybe, yeah, can we talk about like, the art that was associated with flyers or well, backdrops? Litter box. Um, Bob um, was one of our dancers and would always be doing, you know, coming up with different performances. People just wanted to do stuff, so they just come up and say, we're going to do this one. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. And the same with, I mean, Jerome, you just, you didn't know what he was going to do. You never. <laughs> Jerome, yes, he was just always. <laughs> what was the particular memory of Jerome? idea, 
I wanted the, the messaging that you know was very important to me with Club Q and the Vox was this is our community and I want to show our community on these flyers what it when it was just this magic combination. It started with the box where we would photograph everybody that came in the front door and then we started shooting showing them on the screens and you would you would um, see yourself yeah, on the flyers right. of the box. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it was important to me, you know, I, to represent our entire community, it was important to not make perfect, beautiful people, but just to have our community on that. On our, and and, and I, it was, a, it was a, a really powerful, beautiful message. And, you know, as it started to take shape, we got it. You know, we really got the magic of it. And um, I remember Vince, who used to own Zuni, called me up one day and he goes, I, I said, Zuni, I mean, I said, Vince, I mean, we took a photograph of you, can I put you on a box flyer? And he goes, Paige, I would rather be on the box flyer than Linda James be a fool. <laughs> <laughs>
drawing from 80s performance art. So like New York had area, I guess the predecessor to that was Studio 54, you know, which would have a, a half moon drop out of the ceiling with the big coke spoon. Um, so I emulated a lot of that. So yes, there were you know, hot go-go boys on the platforms, but we also did, you guys remember Richie Rich? Um, he was actually a, an ice skater growing up. So I did the entire stage in this plastic, um, you know, faux ice, and he ice skated on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, 10, 15 back then, again, it was a completely open warehouse, which, by the way, used to be Sutro Baths, which was a bisexual bathhouse. So the, the roof opened. Just hit a switch and the entire roof opened, so we would have go-go's come out off the roof from the ceiling coming down, um, and prostitutes performed early on. Um, but again, a lot of the kind of obscure, you know, live body painting. Um, I had a drag queen doing all her laundry in the corner. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, something that goes, that's not 
<laughs> lay it out there. Well, what was a lot of fun, though, is where we got our source materials, like me and my uncle go to the magazine, or all the magazines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we just dig through those. Uh, after Gerard is still out I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs>
someday soon, in the next couple of years, we're going to be having one of these things here at the, at the museum about my television show. <laughs> uh, 60 episodes that no one's seen since 95. Oh, and so they're all going to, after I write my book, they're all going to the museum. And so, um, I had, you know, when I was teasing people on Facebook, I had footage of Miss Uranus and no one's seen it. Oh. <laughs>
Sit down. Sit down. 